There are two main congenital cyanotic heart diseases to be, be aware of. One of them is tetralogy of fallow, and that is a condition in which there are four main abnormalities within the heart. So one of them is pulmonary stenosis, so the valve is narrowed and there's a huge amount of resistance going back towards the right side of the heart. There's a ventricular septal defect that allows blood to mix between the two sides of the heart. There is an overriding aorta, and what that means is that a large proportion of the outflow from the heart will be going into the aorta and not the pulmonary artery. That's due in part to the fact that the pulmonary artery is stenosed and hence there's high resistance there, but there's also this overriding aorta which is basically taking much of the blood from the ventricles. And finally, given that the right heart is having to pump against quite, quite higher pressures than it's used to uh, because of the pulmonary stenosis and the overriding aorta, you get some right ventricular hypertrophy as well. Transposition of the great arteries is the other cyanotic heart disease, and it's a condition in which the aorta and the pulmonary trunk are switched around. So essentially you get two completely independent circuits forming. So one of those circuits is, is basically going uh, to the systemic circulation and back. So in the, in the right side of the heart it receives blood from the peripheries and then pumps it straight out via the aorta to the rest of the body. Then the other separate circuit is going to the lungs and back, so the left side of the heart will be receiving blood via the pulmonary veins and then pumping it straight back out through the transposed pulmonary trunk back to the lungs. So with cyanotic heart disease in general, um, obviously the main feature that we focus on is the cyanosis. The onset of the cyanosis can vary depending on which uh, of the two conditions it is. So with uh, tetralogy of fallow, it can actually take several months for the cyanosis to become apparent. So a lot of the time, um, neonates may present because they seem to be getting a little bit blue whenever they exert themselves. And obviously neonates don't do a huge amount of exerting themselves uh, in, in any conventional way. Uh, it tends to be primarily when they're feeding. So the classical history that's described in SBAs uh, is that uh, the infant will be maybe a month old and turning blue and becoming distressed whenever they are feeding. So it's, it's a bit like a neonatal parallel of exertional dyspnea and heart failure. Uh, in transposition of the great arteries, the only thing that is maintaining life is the ductus arteriosus, because that is allowing blood from uh, the left side of the heart, which is basically oxygenating the blood through the lungs, to mix with the right side of the heart and the aorta and hence be pumped to the rest of the body. So as soon as the ductus arteriosus begins to close within a few days of birth, they become profoundly cyanotic. A murmur can also be quite useful to help distinguish between these two conditions, because in transposition of the great arteries, there's no murmur to be heard, um, because the blood vessels are completely normal in some ways, they're just in the wrong position. Whereas in tetralogy of fallow, you get the pulmonary stenosis, you get the VSD, you get the overriding aorta, and there's a lot of turbulent blood flow that is going to cause a murmur. With regards to investigations, the first most obvious thing to do is check the pulse oximetry. So in transposition of the great arteries, um, neonates are commonly described as suddenly becoming profoundly cyanotic and hypoxic, uh, maybe in the first couple of days of life, and that's because their ductus arteriosus is closing. The other important test to perform is something called a hyperoxia test. And all that means is that a SATS probe is placed on the infant and high flow oxygen is, is, is then applied as well. And uh, you want to see whether the oxygen saturations actually improve. Because in transposition of the great arteries, if these two circuits are completely separate, then even though you're giving high flow oxygen, it will make no difference because the pulse oximeter is only detecting the oxygen saturation of the peripheral blood. So of the right side of the heart, which is, is no longer mixing with the blood from the lungs, and hence you will not see an improvement. Uh, then a chest x-ray may also be performed because it can show some uh, features which help point you in one direction or the other. The first thing to do if a neonate is suspected of having cyanotic heart disease, irrespective of the exact cause, is to start a prostaglandin infusion. So the reason is that a prostaglandin infusion can help maintain the patency of the ductus arteriosus. So you might remember that uh, if, if the ductus arteriosus remains patent pathologically for a long time, it can be closed with NSAIDs like indomethacin. So this is essentially doing the opposite. So indomethacin will inhibit prostaglandin production, whereas in this case you want to keep the ductus arteriosus open 
and hence you start an IV prostaglandin infusion. This is obviously not um, a definitive measure, it's just something that will buy you a bit of time whilst emergency surgery is planned. So I mentioned x-rays a little bit earlier and that's just because it sometimes comes up in exams. Um, there are a few um, descriptions that, that you may see in textbooks as well. So in transposition of the great arteries is described as an egg on a string appearance, whereas in tetralogy of fallow is described as a boot-shaped heart.